Well, I think the first one is going to be we're going to continue uh, with the experimental cone graphic this year that shows the inland watches and warnings uh, for tropical storm and hurricane force winds uh, over inland areas of the United States. This is an example of what the graphic looked like during uh, Helene last year. We also used it for Milton, and both of those were storms that had a lot of inland wind impacts across almost the entire state of Florida in one form or another. But uh, we're gonna continue with this product this year to again, better convey that risk of those uh, wind threats at the coast and inland for everybody. So that'll be a pretty visible thing. The other thing that's gonna change, and this may not be as noticeable to people, but for systems like Helene, that we uh, need to issue uh, forecasts for or watches and warnings for before they become a tropical depression or tropical storm. We'll now have the option to do that as much as 72 hours in advance of impacts beginning on land. So up until last year, we were doing that only about 48 hours in advance. So for you know, higher confidence, higher impact systems like a Helene, we'll be able to start those uh, forecasts even sooner to give people more information at longer lead times. So that would be the potential tropical cyclone you'll be able right. to do earlier. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the potential tropical cyclones, which we end up using quite a lot, and especially for folks in Florida, when we have systems that can form close to Florida, either in the Gulf or the Caribbean or on the Atlantic side, that's a really important uh, you know, tool that we have in our toolbox. Can get, on average, gives us about an additional day's worth of lead time for issuing watches and warnings compared to having to wait for a system to go on and become a tropical depression or tropical storm. So this will allow us to put those forecasts out even before we need to issue, say, a hurricane or storm surge watch. How did um, how did the experimental cone graphic go last year? Were people did people like it? Were they confused by it? What was the response? Overall, the response was largely positive. One change we did make this year was to um, be more explicit on the legend to show those areas that are sort of hatched in the pink and blue that indicate a tropical storm warning and hurricane watch. So we're gonna make sure that that's more clearly conveyed on the legend. Um, otherwise, the graphic's gonna be largely unchanged from what we did last year. The, the public comments we got were rather positive and, and overall it seemed like it uh, you know did pretty well in terms of feedback from partners and in the media and other users. And it was a, a very good year to have it given the inland extent of some of the wind impacts, especially from Milton and Helene. Right. Okay. When did, so it's still experimental. When would it become, when does it become operational or that, or that's all we see? Uh, we don't know yet. I mean, the nice thing about the experimental phase is it allows us to change it relatively easily based on user feedback. So remember last year, we didn't introduce the experimental cone until we were almost halfway through the hurricane season. So we want to make sure we give it at least this uh, 2025 hurricane season to see how it goes, get any other feedback, consider any other changes. Uh, but once a product becomes sort of operational, it's a little more difficult to make tweaks to it. So we want to make sure we're really comfortable with what we're going to um, move ahead with before we make it officially operational. Uh, and you guys, are, are, are studies ongoing about improvements or changes to the comb with the social... Um, social science? Yes, I was yeah. going to say social workers, yeah. but they're not the ones looking at the cone. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's part of a larger effort to you know better understand how people you know consume information about hurricanes, not just depictions of track forecast error or uncertainty, but also hazards. So that was one piece of you know why we decided to put the watches and warnings over inland areas on the cone and actually over top of the cone. So when you see an event like Milton or here with Helene, you can see that you don't even see the cone over those inland areas where those watches and warnings are in effect. So yeah, I mean, we're looking at other options with the cone. Should we try to convey a larger uh, you know, area of track forecast uncertainty? Uh, should we uh, have sort of two different shades of the cone, like a most likely and then a, a possible area of track? So we're still looking at those options. And again, having an experimental version of this will help us to sort of test those out potentially as we go into the future. One other thing I noticed was the rip currents you're gonna try and focus on. What, yeah. What's the product that you'll be using for that? It's basically going to be a viewer that's going to be on hurricanes.gov this year that will allow us to take the rip current forecast information that the local National Weather Service office has put out all across the country and combine it into a single display. So right now that information is put out by, say, the Miami office for, say, you know, Palm Beach southward and then the Melbourne office up into the Treasure Coast up to the Brevard County and Daytona. Uh, but, you know, for a hurricane event, you want to have that sort of big picture, especially on hurricanes.gov because we're looking 
looking at the, the whole storm. So this will just be a way to view all of that rip current information in one place uh, for day one, the current day, and then for the next day as well, so that people can better see those areas where there is that danger of life-threatening uh, surf and rip current conditions. And why did you guys decide to do that? Well, rip currents have been an increasing source of fatalities in tropical storms and hurricanes in recent years. Um, uh, you know, it's it's almost been as many as storm surge if you go back through the last you know seven, eight, nine years. So uh, again, it's a it's a somewhat underappreciated hazard, especially for storms that are far away from the coastline. You can have a storm, uh, you know, passing well to the east of the east coast of the United States, say out near Bermuda, producing dangerous you know, swells and surf conditions. And otherwise it's a pretty nice day for people to go to the beach, uh, and, uh, but they don't realize that the water is not safe. So it's just uh, trying to uh, you know, provide people with as much information as we can to make them aware of those dangerous surf and rip current conditions because they are often are a underappreciated hazard. Usually you lose one or two people at a time. They may not get a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. And you have a lot of people coming to the beach who aren't necessarily familiar with uh, how to be safe in the ocean. Uh, you think about people coming from places where they don't live near the ocean, coming on vacation. They don't understand the dangers that the, the surf can present. And it's important for people to pay attention to those flags and warnings that are posted at the beach and always swim near a lifeguard when you when you can. Great. So last season was busy, um, 18 yeah. named storms. And was, was there any storm uh, that may, that sticks in your mind that was particularly unusual or um, that when you were in the forecast office, you're like, wow, wasn't expecting that. Well, I, I mean, I think Helene really stands out from the storms that we had in 2024. I mean, it's the most impactful tropical storm or hurricane to hit the mainland United States since Katrina. You know, hundreds of fatalities, you know, significant impacts all the way from Florida up through Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, you know, catastrophic flooding uh, from, you know, 25 to 30 inches of rainfall in portions of Western North Carolina, um, extensive wind damage and uh, the largest number of wind fatalities in a tropical storm or hurricane in the U.S. going all the way back to the 1960s. Wow. So just a tremendously impactful storm, uh, again, with a fast moving, powerful hurricane. Uh, moving very quickly inland brought those impacts, you know, hurricane force winds all the way into portions of Georgia with hurricane force gusts up into South Carolina and North Carolina, you know, huge storm surge well above 10 feet above ground level uh, in portions of the Big Bend region, you have multiple storm surge fatalities in the Tampa Bay area. So just a tremendously impactful storm uh, and, uh, you know, challenging to communicate all those hazards, especially to people that may be hundreds of miles away from the coastline but to understand what the impact of that type of rainfall was gonna be, especially in the topography of the Southern Appalachians. Do you have a rainfall product uh, like to warn of the rainfall? Yeah, we, we convey rainfall information from other parts of the National Weather Service. The Weather Prediction Center right. uh, in College Park, Maryland does the large scale rainfall forecasting for the United States. Uh, not just the rainfall amounts, but they also have a product called the Excessive Rainfall Outlook that highlights areas at risk of flash flooding and we certainly do uh, put that product on hurricanes.gov to help convey that threat um, and then local national weather service offices are issuing you know flash flood watches flash flood warnings and flash flood emergencies more in the short term to highlight those areas where flooding is ongoing or imminent okay, great. Um, one thing that was mentioned in the new products is that the cone the track cone is shrinking up to five miles yeah. i think or uh, about five miles um, did I, I thought I had read that this was one of the best seasons for track forecasts at accuracy yeah. this past season? Okay. Any Yeah, twenty twenty four we we set record low track forecast mm -hmm. errors at every forecast lead time from twelve hours all the way out to hundred and twenty. So it was, you know, so our most successful in terms of just error uh, track forecasting season ever. Okay. Was there any storm that was challenging as far as track forecast? Well, they're all challenging, but you know, certainly there were there were some challenges with Helene, uh, especially with its track inland across portions of Georgia into South Carolina. If you remember Milton, um, you know, there was a lot. There was the uncertainty as to whether the center of Milton was going to move you know, north or south of the Tampa Bay region, uh, even though those errors are very small in terms of actual distance, you know, 10, 20, 30 miles, they make a big difference in what those local impacts are. Uh, but, you know, you can see for the large part, if you look back at 2024, we had a lot of activity 
in the deep tropics mm -hmm. and a lot of storms in the western part of the basin uh, and not a lot of long recurving tracks up into the higher latitudes where we tend to have larger track forecast errors. So some of it was just the characteristics of the season. Uh, we had a lot of very strong storms in 2024 and they typically have lower track forecast errors when you get hurricanes and major hurricanes. So that, those were some of the factors that contributed to those lower errors last year. Great, thank you. And so then the other thing uh, I mentioned that I wanted to chat about was just the kind of information you get from the Hurricane Hunter aircraft. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about what, what you guys are getting from them and what it adds to the forecast? Yeah, the, the Hurricane Hunter data is really the most important direct measurements we can get in a tropical storm or hurricane. And so you can sort of think about it as sort of three different types of missions that are flown. There's what we call a fixed mission where the Hurricane Hunter plane flies through the center of the storm and flies in sort of a figure four alpha pattern, uh, measuring the you know, location of the center, the peak winds and the eye wall, how far out the tropical storm and hurricane force winds go in each quadrant of the storm. And that's sort of the standard data that we get that measures the winds at flight level, uh, surface wind estimates, there are drop signs that measure wind speed, direction, temperature, moisture down from the flight level of the aircraft down to the ocean surface. And then the NOAA P-3 aircraft will fly a tail Doppler radar mission that collects Doppler radar data, both in terms of the precipitation structure and the wind data uh, in the core of the storm. And we look at that data here at NHC, and that data also goes into the numerical forecast models. And then if you remember, NOAA has a Gulfstream 4 right. high altitude jet that flies around the storm and samples the large scale environment flying up at, you know, uh, you know, 15, 20,000 feet above the ground. And that's measuring, again, deploying, say, 30 to 35 of those drop sons that fall down to the ocean surface to give us a uh, better understanding of the environment around the storm itself and what uh, factors may influence its eventual track or structure. So the combination of all those data uh, are not just being used here at the Hurricane Center by our forecasters, but they go into the forecast models, models like the GFS or HAVs, and they generally make those track and intensity forecasts about 10 to 20 percent better when we have aircraft data available than when the aircraft data aren't available for whatever reason. Even you can't get to the storm or there has to be a gap uh, when you fly. So uh, we're trying to fly the aircraft as frequently as we can and as early as we can because there's been indications that uh, for storms like Helene, that there are these early uh, stage systems, even maybe before they become a tropical depression or tropical storm, that aircraft data is really, really valuable uh, in getting those initial forecasts right. And that's really important because if you're going to show a storm is going to rapidly intensify or, or to give people a uh, accurate depiction of what sort of hazards they're going to be facing, you need to get those early forecasts right for s systems that form very close to land. Okay. Can, I know this is technical, but what kind of information do the drop sons collect? Is it humidity, wind speed? I, I don't know what. Yeah. Yeah, they measure wind speed and direction, uh, and they also measure moisture or humidity and temperature uh, through the atmosphere as they fall. And then they also measure the ocean temperature when they splash down at the ocean mm -hmm. surface. So all that data is really useful to understand what the environment's like in the storm. Uh, looking at the wind profile data from the drops on, we can estimate how strong the winds are at the surface. Uh, it's also helpful in looking, especially for the high altitude jet, what, what the vertical wind shear looks like or the change in wind speed and direction with height, uh, you know, all the way up into the upper levels of the atmosphere, which is really important for understanding how a storm may strengthen or change in terms of its structure. Okay. Uh, and then I think after the 2024 season, um, radiometer, a radiometer was added to a plane. Am I saying that right? That measures um, foam on the surface to look at wind speed. Is that that's the, that's the SFMR. This, that's oh. been on the aircraft now for many, many years, okay. about, about 20 years or so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, it, and is that how it really looks at the foam, le, foam level on the ocean surface? Yes, it looks at it looks at emissions coming off the ocean surface and it's very sensitive to how much foam or, or with wave breaking on the ocean surface and it can give us a surface wind estimate mm -hmm. based on what it's seeing down there at the ocean surface. So we use that in combination with the other data from the aircraft that's helpful in determining the intensity and structure of the storm. Okay, great. What, if, what about, I mean, the, we have satellites, we have so much, so much going yeah. on as far as helping with the forecasts. Um, and is there a new a new goes east up this year and does it have anything yeah. new on it yeah that's actually what we're looking at here this okay. is goes 19 which okay. is the new operational satellite that covers 
you know, the Atlantic and most of the uh, central and eastern United States. In terms of the weather instruments on it, the ones that are sort of facing toward the Earth, mm -hmm. it's pretty, it's very similar, if not identical, to the previous satellite we had out there, GOES-16. Um, it does have some additional, uh, you know, solar weather type space uh, uh, type instruments, but, you know, it's going to continue to provide us with that very valuable satellite data. You know, again, we're getting these full disk pictures of the entire uh, you know, globe uh, that it can see, you know, every 15 minutes, uh, and we can zoom in on a storm and get data as frequently as every minute or even every 30 seconds. So having that sort of high resolution, both in terms of how often you get the pictures and how much detail you can see, you know, one to two kilometer resolution uh, really allows us to uh, better monitor developing systems as they come across the Atlantic and understand what's going on, not only with the storm, but also in the environment around the storm and how that may affect its future. Great. So the forecast so far this year, and it's way early, um, so everything could change. Um, better yeah. saying normal to slightly above normal year. Um, what would you like readers or viewers to know? I mean, what's the most important thing for you to have them know? Yeah, that uh, seasonal <laughs> hurricane forecast shouldn't have anything to do with how you prepare okay. for a hurricane season. Um, the threat is real every year, especially in Florida is one of the most vulnerable states. Um, you just look at what we had last year, we had five hurricane landfalls in the United States, uh, again, in a year that was, uh, you know, active overall. But uh, again, even in less active years overall, you can still have impacts, uh, you know, in, on, in where you live. And so it's basically think about as we head into hurricane season, know what your risk is, know if you live in a storm surge evacuation zone, that's always the beginning of your preparedness plan. Because if you do, you may be asked to leave your home by local officials in the uh, in the event that a storm threatens. But so you want to have your evacuation plan in place. You want to have your disaster supplies. Think about food, water, medicine, any other medical supplies, any other uh, things you're going to need to basically be self-sufficient for several days in the aftermath of a, of a significant storm. Um, make sure you're insured for your property to protect you and protect the value of your, of your home or business or your property. And uh, again, make sure you are communicating with your friends and neighbors and loved ones so that you can help them be ready for the storm and uh, do what you can to strengthen your home. You know, do you have shutters? Uh, do you need to you know, shore up uh, trees or loose objects around your house? Just basically get ready now uh, as we are still, you know, a little more than a month away from the start of the Atlantic hurricane season uh, so that you don't have to rush to put a plan into place when a storm threatens you. And it's especially important in Florida we can have hurricanes and tropical storms threaten us the entire hurricane season, all the way from June, all the way through November. Thanks, Mike. I don't have any, you've answered all my questions. Um, is there anything I didn't ask that you wanted to add? I just would add, you know, again, for Florida, one of the biggest threats that we have are these, you know, short fuse events that develop where we have a storm form and make landfall after it's rapidly intensified within just three or four days. Storms like Helene, Milton, Michael, Andrew, uh, you go back through some of the most powerful hurricanes that have ever hit the United States. Most of them have formed and made landfall within three or four days. So they're not all like your Hurricane Irma from 2017 that we all watched move across the Atlantic for 10 to 12 days. They're not all going to be like that. So you have to have, again, that plan in place and be able to execute it very quickly if you do have one of these quick uh, uh, developing storms form.